my name, um, for those of you who we've not met, is Michael Goldberg, and I'm the executive director of our new Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship at Case Western Reserve, and I also am an associate professor at Weatherhead, where I teach courses on entrepreneurship. Um, and we are thrilled to welcome back to campus, at least virtually, um, one of our alums, Tim Shigel. Um, and, and Tim has been a presence on campus. Um, we've gotten to know each other the past couple of years as he's um, engaged with, with students, with some of our spin outs as an investor, as a mentor. And um, it's, it's awesome, Tim, to have you here today as part of this series. And um, the, the format that we have, and, and Amar Kazi is going to be our student moderator. And Amar and I have gotten to know each other through his involvement in our Northeast Ohio Student Venture Fund, which is a um, a great way that um, students at a number of universities in Northeast Ohio have been able to get involved in doing due diligence and deploying capital, kind of venture capital-like style. So Lamar's gotten a taste of what um, Tim is working on. And also, um, you know, usually I have to have, you know, Taj Schwarzinger, who's my partner in crime um, at the Beale Institute, and also um, is, is uh, when he's not hanging out with us at Case. And helping students and entrepreneurs is, is a colleague of Tim's at Refinery Ventures. Um, so welcome everybody though. I'm gonna turn it over to Amar who's gonna run the show. The way we do these and some of you guys have been on before is if you have a question that you wanna ask Tim, just let us know. You can post it in the chat. You can raise your hand via Zoom. Um, we'd love for you to ask it directly if you can. It's always sort of more fun to hear it directly from, but if you would prefer for Amar to ask it, and we'll be together for the next hour. So thanks, Tim, and thanks, Amar. Let me turn it over to Amar, who will run the show. Yeah, all right. Thank you, Michael. Um, and hello, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, my name is Amar Kazi, and I'm a rising junior studying economics and chemical biology. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing our guest for today, Tim Shigel. Um, Tim is the founder of Share This, a technology company that nearly a billion people use to share online content every month. Um, Tim has also launched and managed Centrifuge, one of the best performing fund of funds in the country. Um, and Tim is currently the founding partner of Refinery Ventures, um, which is an early stage venture capital firm. And Tim, if you could start off by Refinery Ventures um, and how you got there. I know you have a unique root capital I think we'd all be interested in hearing um, how you found venture capital engineering. Sure, thanks and uh, hi everybody. Thanks for having me, Michael. Um, uh, long circuitous route. So it, it's, it's never a quick story, but I actually got involved in venture in 1998, but I, I consider myself a tech entrepreneur from the start and it's really a hard choice in terms of w whether I'd have more fun running a startup or investing in startups. Um, but Refinery launched about three years ago and it's really a, a culmination of a lot of those experiences and learnings over the years about uh, venture capital generally, but also some of the opportunities and challenges of growing a venture backed uh, tech company in the Midwest or outside of Silicon Valley really. So Refinery's uh, focus is on companies after the seed stage. So um, we like to call it early scale. So if you look at most startup literature, it says, you know, your seed stage, you need to build a, a minimum viable product. You need to get product market fit. Once you get product market fit, then you can scale. Well, it's not that easy. And there's a bunch of steps in between product market fit and scale. And not many people talk about those. And I think that's where there's the most amount of learning still needed in other parts of the country, like Ohio, on, on how to do that so that you can then, you know, grow and scale, become a market leader. So we're focused on that stage uh, when companies already have half a million to a million in revenue and need to start learning how to generate scale in their business. So we've invested in eight companies in the last three years. One of them's already had an exit. And it was out of Charleston, South Carolina, called Engage Talent, was using AI for recruiting. Um, we have three companies based in Ohio, another one in Chicago, another one in Toronto, and another one in San Francisco, and one in 
Lexington, Kentucky. All right, uh, thank you for that. And you said um, you primarily invest in uh, Midwest startups or you're focused in Midwest startups. So what are some challenges that these Midwest startups have that say a Silicon Valley startup have? Yeah, um, yeah, I really wasn't sure how to answer that question early on, even though I've, I live and work here. So I, yeah, I grew up in Cleveland, moved to Cincinnati for my first job. I was the 10th employee of a tech company. And it turns out that tech company, one of the co-founders went to Stanford. And we did a lot of work with Apple. And I had worked with Apple back in, in 1989. So I was part of a rebellious early group working with Apple. Um, turns out the guy, Mark, who hired me, Mark Armstrong, was Neil Armstrong's son. So that was kind of kind of cool. So I worked with Mark and Rick. Um, but Mark went to Stanford, had a bunch of connections. A lot of his friends went to work at Apple. And that started my connection to Silicon Valley. So I've, I've had an office and even um, rental house and stuff in Silicon Valley. So I've been able to kind of compare the West Coast to the Middle Coast. And um, it finally came together and, and sort of the aha moment happened of, three or four years ago when I was working on Centrifuge. So Centrifuge is a fund of funds. So we were investing in other early stage venture funds to attract them to Cincinnati area and get them to invest in startups, right? And uh, so we invested in about 20 venture funds. I've done due diligence on like 200 venture funds all over the country. I looked at venture funds in the Midwest, venture funds not in the Midwest. Really hard to find good venture funds in the Midwest. Uh, that have good results and, and good networks. And um, but I was really working on behalf of the entrepreneurs to help them get funded. And for the startups that had good numbers that were growing, we had no problem getting them funded. And we probably raised about 150 million in three years for those startups, which is pretty incredible. And it really wasn't that hard. And the reason why it wasn't hard was because they had the numbers, the metrics. And uh, a common question I started asking entrepreneurs, let's say these are entrepreneurs with more than an idea, they have real revenue, let's say half a million to a million in revenue. I started asking this question, you know, what would have to be true for you to do 10 million in revenue next year? And I would just get this kind of blank stare, like, like as if that was impossible, right? And I found out that the entrepreneurs aren't asking themselves that question, their investors aren't asking that question, and it finally hit me that the reason they were not asking that question is because they haven't seen much of it. They don't know many people who've had a company that went from zero to 10 million or 10 to 100 or 10 to 50. And uh, so I did a little more research on that and I found out that in, in Silicon Valley, 35% of venture back founders came out of hyper growth companies before but they weren't necessarily the founder, right? Everybody talks about the founders, but a lot of people did something before they became a founder. And the most successful, highest growing companies, the average age is 40. And it's because all of their experience and their network all comes to play and they still have that drive and ambition and youthfulness. Um, and that's kind of the profile in Silicon Valley. So 35% as compared to what I found the numbers to be like in Ohio is like 5%. So think about it. How many people do you know that didn't just start a company that even worked in a company that went from zero to 10 million in revenue? You know, it's probably very few. So we, we don't have it many good models to learn from. And um, that was like the light bulb that said, well, that's the, that's the thing holding back the region is we need more people involved in these companies that understand what that growth looks like, what it feels like, because that kind of growth is managed chaos. It's not a straight line. And until you've done it, you really don't know what it feels like. So we're very interested in um, finding uh, companies that could use that help, partnering with people that I call boomerangs, you know, people that grow up in the area or went to school in the area, went out, had some of that hyper growth experience and now want to come back whether a founder or not a founder doesn't really matter. Cause I think that experience is super valuable 
and we just don't have enough of it. You know, so um, we need we need to get more of it. So that's like the one first biggest gating factor for the uh, companies in the region. There's a second one, actually, I, I'll point out if you, if you let me, Amar. Um, we also did an analysis, uh, actually, our Rishi, our former case intern, helped us with this. We looked at pitch book data to look at graduation rates of companies that go from seed stage to series A. Okay, so what percent of companies that get seed funding, hey, there he is, to series A. And um, the, uh, as, you, as you probably know, when people invest in seed stage companies, they're investing in the idea, you know, the concept and the talent, the person. That's all you really have to go on. But to invest in series A, you need, again, the metrics, the growth. So when we looked at the data, first of all, the trend line has been, it's been going down. So despite the fact that more companies are getting seed funding, that just means the percentage that go to A goes down. Only so many graduate, there's like a finite capacity um, in the market for those Series A deals. But the region that's the lowest and that went down the most is the Great Lakes region, which is pretty incredible because, and I've been saying this since 1998, right? The Great Lakes region makes up about a third of our GDP and the schools and the universities, and the corporations make up like a third of all research in the country. So we have this very strong uh, region from that standpoint, but we only get 3% of the venture dollars. And so going through this, uh, I developed, I, I call it the first principle, which is capital follows growth. Too many people complain about, they, th they think that there's just not enough capital in the region. That's not the problem. Capital would be flooding into the Midwest if there were more companies that had the growth metrics. Investors really aren't that concerned about where they invest. They, they want to invest in great companies, period, wherever they are. So that's the, that's the second big challenge. And that's why we're investing at the stage we are is because the companies need to, in a capital efficient way, start generating the early signs of, of high growth and scale. And if they do, they'll be able to raise money. Amar, are you able to, uh, to hear? I know you're having a look at, looks like he's, he's walking. Amar, can you hear us? Amar, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, we can. This is good. This is like an yeah, action-oriented action speaker series. Our, our moderator. Getting some action stuff now, so. Okay. He's right. adapting. So perhaps I should be better here. Sorry about that, guys. Great. Uh, did you, how about I jump in? I'll jump in with a question as, as you get set. Are you good? Do you have a question or should I jump in? I'll jump in. I'm going to take, I'll take my, my, um, so let me ask you about, and by the way, this is a chance where, cause I see some familiar faces, including students, we, we want to get you guys involved in the conversation. So I will ask the next question, but we're hoping you guys jump in. Yeah. Um, Tim, talk to us about, I mean, a lot of what you're doing, um, on university campuses, um, and it's sort of something close to heart for those of us at Case as we um, try as a university and as a community in Cleveland to sort of more effectively support the growth, taking things out of the lab like folio photonics. What, and you've been obviously involved in a number of these things, wearing different hats, including as an investor. From your perspective, sort of what is missing from um, university ecosystems that sort of can can help the folio photonics or other um, university kind of research um, things that are meant in a lab sort of be successful as as sort of standalone startup companies. Sure. Um, well, first of all, um, and this is something obviously you and Todd working and, and making good progress on is being more market facing as it relates to IP and licensing and tech transfer. I think universities historically, um, it's not that they're, it's, it, it, they get a bad rap, right? A lot of those departments get a bad rap, but it's really because they've been geared towards licensing to big companies, not to startups and ventures. And it's a very different customer. Right, the big companies 
uh, first of all, if you're, if you're in, you know, big pharma, you know who all the big pharma players are, right? There's a handful of them. You know how to find them. You know what they're looking for. Easy. If you're trying to do that into the environment of venture and venture backed startups, it's very diffuse, right? They're, they're, it's very distributed. There's not six VCs or, you know, six groups you can go to and develop relationship over time. So it takes a very different mindset and kind of market interface, I think. And as well as the ability to move faster and move at startup pace and venture pace, not at big co pace. So that's the first one. I think more people are, are starting to figure that out. Um, second, and it relates to the first is more people on staff that understand how to network into that world from an investment standpoint, right? The, um, you, you, many universities try to have, you know, a local venture fund. And I'm not saying that's not a good idea. It is, especially at a seed stage, but it's not enough. You know, just, I, I mentioned the first principle, you know, capital follows growth. Um, uh, the other thing is uh, people invest with people they know, right? That's the second principle, right? So you can't just give a company money and expect good things to happen. You really have to network and help that company network to the right investors for the next stage. I mean, the best entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley know this. When, they, when they're getting a seed investor, they're qualifying that seed investor based on that seed investor's ability to attract the Series A investor. And when they get a Series A investor, they're doing that based on the ability to attract the Series B investor, right? They want to know that you can make the warm introductions because, of course, the entrepreneur is not likely to have those relationships. So I think that's a, that's a, big, uh, that's a big gap, um, that could easily be filled. Um, and it, it takes also a bit of that change of mindset, not thinking like, oh, we're just going to do the investments ourselves and it'll take care of itself. But it takes a very uh, concerted uh, investment in time and relationship building with uh, other investors. Um, and I know in, in a, a case that's starting to happen more and more with, with your efforts and with what Scott Shane's been doing, he's been broadening the universe, which I think is great because you want as many different investors as possible uh, interacting with entrepreneurs and technologies that are coming out of case. I'm a big believer in the technology. And as you said, Michael, you know, I've, I've maintained relationships about 25 universities. I think our universities, uh, especially in our, our region are really, you know, are really the best, we have great, great technology, great talent, but it's disconnected. It's in, it's on an Island a little bit. And we got to start making those connections. And one source of capital is not enough. You need a hundred different sources of capital. Okay. And so we also have another, we have a question from chat. So uh, Vedika, if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask it or um, I could also say it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, could you elaborate a little more on what growth metrics you mean startups need to meet in order to sort of attract the capital uh, if, you know, capital follows growth? Sure. Um, so this, this is a class, <laughs> you know, this, this, there's a lot to this. I'll try to, I'll try to hit the high points. Um, uh, very good question. And it's a question that any entrepreneur and founder needs to understand the answers to specific to their business and their industry. So you can't just have somebody give these to you. You really need to know them intimately by studying other companies uh, in your space and in your market. But let's, let's stay from the starting point of after seed and you've got some customers. I think of, when you think of revenue, think of two different phases or stages of revenue. The first stage up to about a million of revenue is, I call it test revenue. The second stage is scale revenue, okay? The first test revenue is you're not optimizing for cash flow or profitability or even growth. You're optimizing for learning. You're trying to get as much learning out of every customer interaction that you have at that stage to figure out what's the ideal customer profile. How, which, which of those customer types can I go replicate times 100 or times 1,000? That's what you're trying to figure out. So you want, if, if, you, if it takes five customers to get to a million dollars or 50, you want it to be a good sample of what you think your market representation is 
and take that learning. And then as you go to the next phase of scaling revenue, go deeper into those segments, right? Because not every customer is the same. And you can't, and just saying B2B or enterprise isn't enough. So you really got to get uh, good at that. So um, it's, a, it's a common pattern I see with our comp companies is they need, to, they need to get much more specific about who their customer set is. Just like, I mean, the simple example here is Amazon, right? Amazon, Jeff Bezos had a vision for e-commerce, but they looked at a bunch of different product categories and market categories and figured out that books were the best place to start for a lot of different reasons, because of inventory issues, because it's easy to buy online, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go get momentum in that vertical. So um, test revenue versus scale. The, the next thing um, that I would, I would um, mention generally, and it's part of the challenge when you're a startup that's not in Silicon Valley or New York, Boston area, perhaps, is your growth needs to be compelling enough that somebody would actually get on an airplane to hear your pitch or take a phone call. Because if you're not growing three to five X year over year, like, so if you're at a million, if you're not showing signs of going to three to five, the chances of you attracting capital from outside the region get very low. Not because you don't have a great idea, not because you're not smart, but it's an opportunity cost because that investor sitting in Silicon Valley can find a hundred other companies going from 1 million to 2 million right? And maybe even 1 million to three. But if you call and say, here's an interesting idea and we're going from one to five, they're, they're going to pay attention, right? Because those are harder to find. So I, what I see a lot happen in the region um, is that you have companies that go from you know, half a million to a million or 250 to 500 or a million to 2 million. And they're celebrating that growth, which they should, but they also need to know that growth's not compelling enough to attract the world's best investors, which is if you're taking venture capital outside uh, capital, that should be your goal. If that's not your goal, then you just shouldn't raise money, you know, besides friends and family. Um, so it's in that range of three to five X year over year growth. And there's a bunch of other rules of thumb that you can find online. If you've ever heard of um, there's two others, you know, year over year, like especially with SaaS, year over year growth um, from starting place of a million being two triples and three doubles to use a baseball analogy. So one goes to three, three goes to nine, and then nine goes 18, 18 to 36, 36, 72. If you did that, by the time you got through with that, you could be a public company. So that's helpful to know because it's a rough roadmap and entrepreneurs should take that and challenge themselves to match, you know, to match that and try to produce that growth. Um, and if they do, good things will happen. Now, the caveat there, the only other caveat is you have to do it in a capital efficient way. And that's where it helps to look at other startups in the space to find out how much money did they take? How much money are they consuming to generate that growth? If you're, if you're um, consuming too much cash to make that happen, uh, you're, you're not likely to survive or, you know, build a good long-term business. So, the capital efficiency is a really important point. And that's, I think, where the Midwest can really stand out because too many times in Silicon Valley, they have the momentum play where they just spend, spend, spend. And in a good market environment, that works. But when things like COVID happens, those companies are in big, big trouble. So hopefully hopefully that helps. Yeah, that, that was... Okay, so does anyone else have any questions uh, for Tim right now? Oh, okay, so we have a question from Mandy. Um, would you like to unmute? Sure. Hi, Tim. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. I'm Mandy Varley. I'm a PhD student in organizational behavior. So my question is related to the human side. Um, so I loved your description of large scale growth as managed chaos and that a lot of people don't understand what that feels like that was a really visceral sort of um, description. So I can see that there's revenue growth happening, but I also imagine that you're adding to the team. So the team is growing. Um, so what do you see as some of the key people related challenges that startups are having as they're trying to grow? And are there things that universities could do or that the startups themselves could do to make them grow more effectively? Thank you, Mandy. That is a great question. I love it for a bunch of different reasons. Um, 
my major was electrical engineering, but my minor was in psychology. And I always tell people most of the books on my shelf are psychology and leadership development, because that's actually the harder part, right? The technology, not hard. The finances, not hard. People are hard, okay? So what I discovered in my own startup, so when I built Share This, our first half year of revenue. When we started generating revenue, we had $700,000 in revenue, which wasn't bad, a half a year. The next year we did, our plan was to do 10 million, which is kind of crazy. We did 12. The year after that, we did 32. The year after that, we did 50 something. So it made it one of the fastest growing companies in the country in Silicon Valley. And what I discovered early on when we were at about 15 or 20 people uh, is um, it goes back to the hyper growth question or issue I mentioned earlier, right? Um, some people scale with the business and some don't. And that's okay. Certain stage of the business, you need somebody who's like the utility player, somebody who can wear multiple hats and is good at sales, but is also good customer delivery is also maybe even development, who knows. But over time, people, you have to organize, right? And those people don't always scale with the organization. And what I started to see were a lot of kind of scared faces in that 15 or 20. And it hit me that most of those people probably came from very comfortable environments, right? Where their role, their job function, their title didn't change much. Their desk was always next to the same window. They went to coffee with the same group of people all the time. You know, they just... And it's fun. In those early days, you're, you're all in the foxhole together. You know, you're, you become a very tight-knit group. But if you're successful, it's not going to be tight-knit for very long, right? And matter of fact, if you're going well, it's changing about every quarter. So I started developing this a bit of a speech, you know, for everybody once a quarter because inevitably some people wouldn't work out. They'd leave or I'd have to let them go. And I definitely resolved myself and my challenge as a leader was letting people go in a way that was full of respect and that those people would come back and want to visit the company three months later, which they did. And I still keep in touch with a lot of these folks um, uh, because we're just trying to match the person's skill set and what the company needs at that time. That's it, right? It's not, doesn't have to be personal. Um, so I was very transparent and, um, and um, we acknowledged that that fear and complexity and chaos was there, right? And we, we embraced it and some people could really go with it. It helped us in terms of the skills we were looking for. But oftentimes what happens um, when you're growing like that, the other big challenge is um, one of the hardest things we do is hiring. People's success rate in hiring is terrible. Right. Jack Welsh, if anybody's studied Jack Welsh from GE, you know, he was considered one of the best at it. And the GE training is world class. And he said in his best day, he's only 70%, you know, accurate. Um, most entrepreneurs don't plan for that. They don't understand that, you know, they just put on a spreadsheet, oh, I'm hiring five people next month and I'm hiring another five the next month. They don't understand that if they hire five, maybe two of them work out. Right. And that that has a time and a cost associated with it. So when you're doing projections, I rarely see anybody put that in their projections. Right. Um, and so that's part of what we do in terms of helping our companies scale is help them think about that because it's and it's not just a cost issue. It's a time issue. It takes time to interview these people. It takes time to build that capability and to get good at hiring for the organization. Um, and to great good hiring managers in the organization. So what tends to happen though is you're trying to meet the demand, so you tend to overhire. And then, so it's cycles of overhiring and pruning, is what my experience has been. Not everybody has. Some people do it perfectly and they can just hire and never have to let anybody go. But I think that's pretty rare. What I see more often is we go from 20 to 40 people or 20 to 50 people. And then there's 10 or 15 of those people that just don't make it to the next stage. And then you go from that 50 to 100. So that's a, that's a cycle that entrepreneurs should be aware of. And I don't think there's anywhere near enough literature, or documentation or, um, on how 
leaders have to think about that. I got the thumbs up. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess we can continue talking about how these leaders have to think. Um, and especially in these times, what are some creative ways for entrepreneurs to, to look for funding now? So uh, in the early stage, seed stage, um, most of your funding's likely to come from people who know you. It's kind of like the joke with NASCAR and you know, car racing. Car racing is very, very, very expensive. And most of the stickers you see on the car are people's relatives, <laughs> right? They, uh, it's the same with startups. Um, most seed funding comes from people that know you. It also comes local. So with Centrifuge, we tried to invest in some seed funds that weren't in the region, and we didn't get, we didn't, we had a hard time getting them to invest in Cincinnati from the coast because they just, seed stage takes a lot more engagement and it's much more about understanding and knowing who the people are. Um, it takes a lot of networking and applying for every program there is, you know, you, you, you're, you're trying to un uncover every rock you can, it takes a ton of networking. You, it's not something I recommend outsourcing to somebody you know, if you look at any successful entrepreneur, odds are they're also a world-class fundraiser, right? That, and um, it's a skill that you have to develop. If you don't have it already, you probably don't have it already, right? Most people are developing it. Um, so, um, but it's all good. What you have to look at it as is, is learning. It's like I tell my wife one time when I'm fundraising for the fund, I said, imagine waking up every morning knowing that 99.9% .9 of the people are going to tell you no and still smiling and getting up and getting up early and doing it anyway, right? Yeah, if anybody's done any kind of door-to-door -door sale selling or anything like that, I mean, it's, it's hard. Most people are gonna tell you no. And what you have to look at is um, the network and the relationships you're gonna build. Some of those may end up being very long-term. It may be no today, but it may be yes in the future. Um, it's an opportunity to build fans and supporters. And, it, and it's also an opportunity to learn unless you go out and talk to a lot of people and let them shoot holes in your plan, right? It just makes your plan better. So, so when you think of fundraising, you got to think of all those dimensions. It's not about just getting the money, right? It's all the learning that goes on through the process that helps make you better. And, and then I guess the final thing I would say is, um, you know, the quality of the investor is the most important thing. It's not just the money. You need people that can help you, that understand what you're going through. The challenge we have in the Midwest is we have a lot of people with a lot of money that made their money in traditional businesses, not tech-enabled businesses, not venture capital-based businesses. So there's two problems with that. One, they don't know how to build. They're focused on building a traditional business in a traditional way, which usually means slow. And um, second, they don't have they don't have a network to other investors. So they can't help you with introductions. So I've seen a lot of investors, uh, big, big individual investors or family office investors put tens of millions of dollars into companies and then be disappointed when it doesn't work out. And what they didn't realize is it wasn't, it wasn't just about the money, right? It, it is about the expertise and the coaching and the advice and the networks you get by getting the right investors. You want somebody who's seen this one, this play before and can walk you through that to, um, it, to help you avoid critical mistakes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and so now we have a question from Fred. Um, if you can unmute. Okay. Uh, it, you're trying to analyze this for all startups in general, but I think it should be divided into two specific cases. One would be the startup of a person just beginning his career, and the second would be a startup of a person who's well into his career. The one who's well into his career uh, frequently has different requirements, for example, uh, the capital requirements may be much lower, but the need for customers may be much higher uh, because of the immediacy. Uh, what we found is that 
while it may be easier to raise money from people you know, it's much easier as an experienced startup to have customers who don't know you very well. Your friends tend to be very leery about small companies, especially new upstarts. And I, I think we would gain from uh, dividing this world of uh, startups in, into, two, into those two categories. I think the needs are very different. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. And there's, there's also another dimension. There's probably several ways to divide it. The other where I thought you might be going also is there are companies and startups that just, they need some capital, but they really don't need venture capital or shouldn't be chasing venture capital, right? So I've got a lot of friends that have businesses that don't take any venture capital that are very successful, generate cash flow, and they make a lot of money, but you're not going to read about them in Entrepreneur Magazine or Forbes um, uh, because they didn't go out and um, raise a bunch of money and generate PR for those reasons. Um, the other thing you, is, you mentioned that's important there is customers. And I do think it's, it's harder to get customers than it is investors. If that's where you're going, I agree 100%, right? If you have customers, then it's easy to get investors. If you have investors, it doesn't necessarily guarantee you're going to get any customers. So figuring out how to get customers is like the number one biggest uh, challenge and issue. And um, that any business has to figure out, right? And it has to do with what you're selling, obviously, but it also has to do with the market conditions. I've seen great entrepreneurs with great products fail because the market wasn't ready. And you see that a lot in venture. A lot of companies don't work out because they were five or 10 years ahead of the market. So the key is to match your timing with the customer timing and the market timing. So it's a lot like the analogy I use is like a surfer and a wave, right? the surfer being the entrepreneur and the wave being the market. A good surfer doesn't get up on their surfboard when there's no wave. They understand how to wait, wait for the right swell. And even an entrepreneur that's not that good with a product that's not that good can be extremely successful if they're in the right market. Mark Cuban wasn't necessarily that great. He was just at the right time and he rode a big wave <laughs> and it's, he's still riding it, right? Hopefully that helps. All right, and now we have a question from Cooper. Um, if you could unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for coming in. I think kind of bouncing off on the question you just asked, you talk about how a lot of companies in the Midwest come from that more traditional, slower paced growth. And I was wondering how can a company kind of prepare themselves at, right from the get go on first more of a rapid growth path? Um, so two things, one, one, do your homework. Right. What, what are the companies that you will find companies that you aspire to be like and study them uh, intimately and understand what their growth look like and figure out what it's going to take. So that's, that's one. And that, again, you can't outsource that or delegate it. You should do it. Right. You should look. And, and today it's so much easier than it used to be 20 years ago or so you didn't have the internet. And so finding out that private information was really hard, which required you to do more networking. Today, you can get a lot of it, but still some of it won't be, won't be out there and you still have to do networking to, to kind of fill in the gaps. You know? Um, you know, for example, how much capital did you raise before you got to a million in revenue? Right? How long did it take you to go from a million to 10? All those kind of questions. If you, can, if, you, if you know that answer for two or three companies in your market, then you're way ahead. Uh, second thing is, is your advisors, whether the advisors are investors or not, you know, advisors and mentors that specifically have been in that before. Um, I see too many times that like accelerators, they have a lot of mentors, which is great, but you gotta be careful to make sure that, that what you expect from those mentors, right? If it's a mentor that can help you with understanding a product, that's great. They're not necessarily the growth mentor, right? So make sure you're getting, uh, you understand where that mentor is coming from, but find people that have that, that hyper growth experience and get them to challenge you and to share their experience. And I think that'll, that'll help a lot. Uh, again, you have too many, um, it's, it's easy to pat yourself on the back if you're growing and you're doubling in revenue and it is a good thing, right? But it, but that's not the expectation. 
so of of a venture capital firm, right? The expectation is for something higher. And I think that's that's the word I've kind of settled on. When you look at, and Michael, you probably know the Scout RFP founders, right? You look at them or the founder of GitHub, who was like a University of Cincinnati dropout. You know, those are cases that prove that the talent and the ideas are here, right? But, and, and then they go to the West Coast and you say, well, they went to the West Coast for the capital. And I don't think that's it. They go to the West Coast for the expectations, right? The, the network of people and the expectations of the people they're surrounding themselves with are, we're going to build a world-class company that's going to be, become a market leader, right? We're hitting a home run. And I see that a lot where in the Midwest, you know, some investors or advisors might go, that's nice, but tone it down, tone down your expectations a little bit. You know, you're sounding a little crazy. Let's hit a double and we'll be happy. And, um, you know, being, being cautious has its place. But when you're talking about trying to grow a hyper growth company and trying to own a market, you need people who are going to challenge you to go fast and, and um, yeah, and be aggressive. All right, and I think we have time for one last question from uh, Tiffany, if you can unmute yourself. Can you speak a little bit to the challenges of, you know, so you're in early stage, you see you've got real growth potential and you're bringing on a number of customers and how you manage those customers, the customer service component, while you're working 12 to 18 hours a day on the technology, um, you wanna make happy customers so you get more customers. You know, can you speak a little bit to that and, and where some of your thoughts are in, in you know, I mentor some of these students and thinking about how to guide them in that time is, is very challenging for them. It is. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's an, and it doesn't stop by the way, if you're a fast growing company, product development never stops. Some people will think, Oh, we built the widget. Now let's just go monetize it. Nope. Doesn't happen. You look at any fast growing successful company, they're heavily investing in product always, right? They continue to continue to go. Um, a couple of different things uh, on that. And, and I'll give you an example. I want to tell you the MailChimp story. So don't let me forget that. But first, um, you know, my rule of thumb is until you have five customers, you don't have a product. Five customers using the same thing, right? And so uh, oftentimes you get companies that are caught, they're more like a consulting company that's building custom software instead of building a product. If you want to build a product that scales, you got to build a product that requires low touch and offers high value, right? The second thing is, um, and, and there's an organization called Star Startup Genome that did a study on this, and they looked at startups that succeed and startups that don't succeed. And the ones that don't succeed actually scale prematurely, and they actually bring on too many customers too early, and um, they have too many developers. It's a focus issue. What you need to focus on is not developing every feature that you can imagine, but find out what's the key thing that had, delivers the most compelling ROI or value proposition so that a customer turns the thing on and in minutes or a day, they're getting value. If it takes 90 days before they're starting to see value from your solution, that's too long. So one of the metrics we do at our startups and we train all the startups in OKRs, objectives and key results, you know, um, is time to value. How soon after the customer bought the software are they seeing value and ROI? And if it takes too long to install it and then it takes too long before they see the results, there's a good chance you're gonna have high churn. So in the early days, uh, again, optimize not for number of customers, but number of different customers, like a, a, a good sample. Like we want a mid-range manufacturing company, we want a big manufacturing company, um, we want a retail company and a manufacturing company, whatever that mix is. And then work really, really hard to figure out which of the things you're doing for them produces the most value. And that, that's hard, but you got to get the team to focus on the customer, right? Because otherwise everybody has their pet projects. Oh, I think this, this thing I built is this great wizard and it's awesome. And it might be, but that maybe can wait till next year, right? If it's not delivering on what they need, you're probably developing too much. So most teams are developing too much. So so the, this gets back to MailChimp. And um, before I got into venture, I kind of became a bit of a customer, voice of the customer, customer-driven design 
product design person. I did a lot of work in Asia with like Hitachi in Japan or Samsung in Korea and others helping them go to market faster by doing customer driven design. And um, a lot of methodologies out there you can use, but, but the principle needs to be, you know, you're serving the customer period. Not you're, you're not serving yourself. You're not building stuff because you think it's cool. You're building it because they think it's cool. Um, so MailChimp. So I was talking to Dan Kurzius, who's one of the co-founders of MailChimp. And they are, I don't know where they are now, five, 700 million in revenue. Uh, when I was talking to them, they were like 300, going from 300 to 450 uh, with zero outside capital. Didn't need any venture capital. So I asked him, so what, what do you, why, do, why were you able to do that? What do you attribute that to? And his answer was a customer. When anything else, he said, you know, they, they, they were small, small business people. And they started building this product and the, um, they tried selling to enterprise and they realized that uh, they weren't good at it and they actually didn't like it. They didn't like putting a suit on and going to some big tall building. They hated it. And so they decided with no further analysis than that, we're not serving that market. They didn't, they didn't, you know, they didn't do a SAM and a TAM and figure it out market size. They went where they felt that where they wanted to serve, right? And the customers they they, they were passionate about that we wanted to serve and that was small business. So that was step one. So they say, okay, we're, we're all about small business. Second, um, they're always trying to live and, and look at the world from the small business perspective. And as you get bigger, that gets harder for every employee to do, right? Some people are developers or they work in some other part of the business. So they don't interact with customers often. So they spend, this may be an exaggeration hyperbole, but it, it sounded like they basically spend more money internally marketing the voice of the customer than they do on external marketing. So they regularly bring customers into their office to have customer days so that employees that don't normally interact with customers can talk to real customers, right? You think about in startups, there's, I can think of a bunch of startups that have 20 people and, you know, 15 of them don't interact with the customer directly, Right. Uh, no matter what your role is, if you have a context of the customer, you're going to do a better job thinking about how they're perceiving you, right? So um, MailChimp spends a bunch of money. They, they, they produce videos. They, they, they get really creative. And the goal of that creativity is to help every single one of their employees understand the customers. Because the more they understand customers, the more they understand the problem which leads to solutions, right? So that that's, that's what drives their roadmap. And the more they understand the problems, they go, oh, we can solve that for you. Okay, that's a problem. We'll go figure out how to solve it. And so the company continues to grow uh, because of that. You're welcome. All right. And so I think we're going to wrap it up here, but we have, we'll, we'll, um, we'll give like a wrapping up question. So with so many students having lost their inter internships. Um, do you have some like piece of advice for students trying to navigate this crisis? Um, yeah, well, you know, good entrepreneurs, you know, make uh, lemonade out of lemons, uh, no matter what, right. And so um, matter of fact, that's part of that. That's why our company is named refinery. Because as leaders, we are refined through adversity. Right? It's only through overcoming challenges that you become a leader. You're, you're not born a leader. It's by overcoming challenges and entrepreneurs always face, face challenges. And um, I may face more challenges today and tomorrow and next week. And um, every time I face one and overcome it, my confidence grows, right? So this is just, just see it as one next challenge to overcome before the next round. So I'm sure everybody has different goals in terms of what they're trying to accomplish that can be accomplished, whether it's an internship or something else, but it's all part of learning and experiential learning. And I think there's a lot of different creative ways to get around that um, if you're hungry for it and you, and you want to do it. Um, you know, I would do anything to get into venture capital, right? You didn't have to pay me. You didn't have, I mean, venture capital to me was like, you know, somebody telling me I got to be Santa Claus or something, right? It's like, it's just the ultimate dream job and experience. So I would do just about anything. I still stayed with my wife. I didn't, I didn't, uh, 
I didn't, you know, leave my marriage, but other than that, I would do anything. Um, so it depends, you know, it, it's a good time when you're challenged like this, it does force you to prioritize what's really important to you. And, you know, maybe this entrepreneurship thing or venture thing sounded cool when the market was up and maybe it's not, not as cool now when you're looking at, Hey, I also have to make money. Um, I need to learn things. So it helps you with that reevaluation of what your um, priorities are. But I would say, you know, just embrace it, you know, embrace it. And uh, I think this is from a company standpoint, I, this is always the best time to build a company. This is, you know, during the last recession is when I built share this, it was a great time because it, it forces you to focus when things, when everything's going well and you, you, you know, people, it's just like um, playing a slot machine or something, right? Success just seems random when the market's really going well, right? You see people that shouldn't be successful being successful and you just can't make any sense of it because everybody's winning in some way. In this environment, people that are winning are the people that are focused and are good at what they do and are driven. And um, it's, it's, it's really your time to shine. And, and uh, so I, I think it's a, I'd encourage anybody, everybody that's going through this to just to be positive, embrace it, and look for chances to learn and continue to build out your, your network, which is also hugely important in this day and age. All right. Thank you so much, Tim. And with that, I'll bring it back to uh, Michael Goldberg. Thanks, Amar. Um, and Mar, thank you for doing such a great job moderating and, you know, dealing with your, what, giving us a tour of your house while you were moderating. We always appreciate, you know, getting to know what our, where our right. students live. Thank you. Um, Tim, thank you for doing this again. You've been a great, um, you know, resource. You brought us Todd. I don't know if we should thank you or curse you for that, but um, it's, uh, you know, we do appreciate your engagement and, and, and during these times where we're not all together in person, but look forward to doing it in person. I think actually your presence on campus and with Folio and on the sixth floor of Thinkbox and being a resource to our students and, um, and faculty and others is, is great. So it's awesome having you engaged. So thank you for doing this. Happy to do it. I'm looking forward to a lot more success there too. Now we got this power team put together. We need to create some, some big more wins. Totally. We're working on it. We'll make you proud. We'll make you proud. Um, just a quick preview of upcoming lectures where, um, this was, uh, Tim, this was Venture Capital Private Equity Week. So we had Jack yeah. Daly, who you may know, who's a private equity um, exec at TPG Global. And yesterday we had Sean Gandhi, from, um, who's a uh, healthcare venture capitalist up in Boston from North Pond. Next week, a little more diversity, branching out from the venture. So on Tuesday at 1 o'clock, we're going to be joined by um, a trio of uh, of entrepreneurs and, and healthcare professionals, Dan Moore, Zach Ponsky, and um, hey, Mata Halu, um, in conversation about a, a ventilator they brought to market sort of rapidly to help address um, the, the shortage of ventilators. So that'll be Tuesday at one. And then on Wednesday, we're going to have two conversations. The first is at 9 a.m. So, you know, join us for breakfast um, with a focus on Tanzania. So, some entrepreneurs from Tanzania that we got to know a couple of years ago and, and the moderator will be a former Peace Corps volunteer from case. Um, and that i um, kind of focused on what's happening with COVID there. And then Rachel Paul, who has a nutrition company will be in conversation with us at one o'clock. And then Thursday we'll focus on impact investing with Sarah Morgan Stern from Flourish Ventures, which is part of, um, of uh, the Omidyar network. Pierre Omidyar was the founder of eBay is doing a lot of impact investing. So lots to keep you busy as the weather starts getting nice and you probably want to do less zooming and more walking around outside, but spend an hour with us. It's fun. Um, so again, Tim, thanks for doing this. And uh, Amar, thanks for moderating and great to see everybody. And, and we'll see you hopefully next week. Have a great uh, weekend.